Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord God of truth. Psalm 31, 5. Welcome to the Into Your Hand podcast with Brendan and Wesley. Today we are discussing the Sabbath School Bible Study for January 16th, 2021. This quarter is entitled Isaiah. This week's lesson is entitled When Our World is Falling Apart. The memory verse this week is Isaiah 7, verse 6. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. A special thank you to Fountain View Academy for giving us permission to share their music ministry with you. Links to Fountain View Academy are in the description. God bless you all. They journeyed far, a weary pair. They sought for shelter from the cold night air. Some place where she could lay her head, where she could give her babe a quiet bed. Was there no room, no corner there in all the town? spot someone could spare was there no soul come to their aid a stable bear was where the family stayed do you have room for A star rose, a wondrous light, a sign from God, this was the holy night. And yet so few would go to see the babe who came to rescue you and me. This child divine is now a king, the gift of life to all the world. have sought the light Do you have room? Will you come tonight and will you seek the Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, uh, for waking us up and giving us life to praise and honor you. Lord, be with this lesson. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for reaching out to us. 
Thank you for impressing us to study and to do your will. Fill us, Lord, with your righteousness. Give us repentance and faith. Save us for your mercy's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's great to gather this morning and study the lesson together, lesson three, when your world is falling apart. And to read the Bible verse once again, Isaiah chapter seven, verse nine. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Our lesson on Sabbath starts with a story of, uh, it sounds like a country home in which the owner comes back and they have some pets. And unfortunately, a, a little neighbor dog comes over uh, named Beethoven and causes a lot of disruption by attacking her, her pet chicken. And then her duck sees her holding the pet chicken in her hand. And the duck thinks that Connie, the woman in the story, killed the chicken and then viciously attacks her for that because of that mistake. She, th she thinks that the, her owner killed the chicken in which she was friends with. So the, the point of that story, sometimes it's hard to sort out who your friends and enemies are. And isn't that the case when it comes to God's love and his people? Far too often, something bad happens in our lives or in the lives of someone else. And the first one to blame is God, when he's the one who is trying to provide protection and direction. He's the loving father, just as in this story, it was the loving owner of these pets who came home and found something tragic happening, and her heart was broken. But then her duck thought that she was the one who did it and blamed her for it. So when it comes to faith, we need to always remember that God is on our side and trying his best to work in our lives for the greater good. He's with us on this journey, and he cares for us very dearly. Let's look at Sunday's lesson. Wesley, do you have a Bible verse to share with us? Uh, yes. Uh, the lesson tells us to read Isaiah 7, 1 to 9. Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Ramilia, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to rage war against it but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying the Armenians have camped in Ephraim, his heart and the hearts of the, his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Sher Jabsheb, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Amram and the son of Remilia. Because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Remilia has, has planned evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set up the son of Tibil as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Now within another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered, so that it is no longer a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remilia. If you will not believe, you shall surely not last. The kings are coming against Jerusalem. They are on their way. And it seems that Ahaz is checking out the, the walls, checking out the cisterns and seeing how mighty they are and how they are going to last in this siege. And the lesson tells us that as Ahaz's world was falling apart, that he sought a friend. But he did not seek God. Uh, Second Kings tells us that he sought after the king of the Assyrians. And we know that Assyria is the nation that destroyed the northern kingdom. So Ahaz is uniting with the enemy here 
Isaiah is sent to him to say, you know, don't worry. I'm going to, I've got this, you know, you know, I've got this. This is easy. I've got this all taken care of. Don't worry about it. And he has just completely ignores Isaiah and does his own thing. When we read about Ahaz, it is understandable why he reacted to danger as he did. What lesson is here for us on a personal level? If you're not obeying the Lord now, what makes you think we'll have the faith to trust him when real trials come? Uh, this is a really great question. Ahaz had an enemy coming. He sought a solution that did not involve God. His faith was very weak. And we learn later that he uh, rejected it, rejected God completely. And so, you know, if we can't obey God in the small things, how are we going to deal with real issues come along? The lesson says for us to read James 2.22. You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Also, Jeremiah 12.5. Jeremiah 12, 5. If you have run with footmen and they have tired you out, then how can you compete with horses? If you fall down in the land of peace, how will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? So God is telling us here to trust him in our personal issues and our daily walk, to trust him. We must trust him every day to endure the small trials so that our faith is strong for the real test comes, right? Do you have any comments on Sunday's lesson? Well, it's just one of not compromising. So I uh, like halfway down the lesson it says, rather than recognizing that God was the only friend who could rescue him and his country, Ahaz tried to make a friend out of Tiglath Pileser III, the enemy of his enemies. So he was compromising the faith of his nation, and he was the leader of that nation. He was the one to hold to God for the sake of not only himself, but his people and their future. So when we face trials, we shouldn't look for the lesser evil and cling to it, whether that be a political leader or something of an addictive nature. I will leave this addiction for that addiction. We need to submit ourselves to God and realize that he can carry us and he will carry us through that trial. And that's very important for us to always keep in mind that this purification process, this path that we're on, God is always with us and he's always caring for us. You reminded me of something. And that is like if we had like some sort of diary where we wrote our stresses and then we wrote weeks later, how God took care of them, or, oh, I don't even remember being stressed that day. We would see, you know, that we are often scared and timid and nervous and anxious about things that we really shouldn't be, and that the re end result was much better than we thought. Remembering those episodes in our lives could help the next time a problem comes. Also, sometimes we have so much stress over things we can't change and that we don't have control over. Those are situations that are ripe to be put at the cross. Uh, let's go on to Monday's lesson. Uh, it tells us to read Isaiah 7, 3 to 9. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shir Bashib, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller field, and say to him, Take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Amram and the son of Amelia, because Amram with Ephraim and the son of Remelia has planned evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin. Now within another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered so that it is no longer a people, 
and the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remilia. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. It says here in our lesson, while Ahaz was weighing his political options to meet the threat with Israel and Syria, God knew some things he did not. For one thing, it was God who had allowed trouble to come upon him in order to discipline him and bring him to his senses. Second Chronicles 28, 5 and verse, also verse 19. Moreover, although appealing to Tiglath-Pileser for help seemed logical and attractive from a human standpoint, God knew it would bring the Davidic kingdom of Judah under foreign control from which she could never recover. What do you think about that sentence, God who had allowed trouble to come upon him in order to discipline him and bring him to his senses? We often think of the love and blessings that God gives only in a humanistic positive point of view. What is good for me? And people will think those blessings that are directly given, packaged, wrapped with a bow, those things that I can enjoy immediately, gratification. That's often how we think of God's blessings. But when we're on a path of self-destruction, one of the greatest blessings that we could ever receive is one of discipline and reproof that adjusts our path from heading off the cliff to back towards the straight and narrow. He did this often with the nation of Israel and Judah. Really an understanding, a theological understanding of where we understand God, whether Calvinistic, Armenian, or open theist, is really a beneficial thing for a Christian believer. Now, these terms may seem daunting, and there are many theologians who have written extensively over the last few hundred years concerning especially the first two. But in brief, Calvinism is that you are predetermined to be saved or lost, and that each decision is predetermined as well. Whether that pen in your hand is picked up or put down, it was the will of God that it happened as it did. Now, an Armenian type of view is that God gives free will, but that he knows the future completely. So you're free to pick up the pen or put it down, but he always knew if you would pick it up or you would put it down. And an open theist type of view is that God is present and active in your life, that he is influencing you through the work of the Holy Spirit for you to know the scriptures, for you to do the will of God, because it is for your best interest, and it will lead you on paths of righteousness for his honor and glory and for your happiness, for the fullness of truth to be established in your life, and for you to reach heaven and be one with the Father, and praise the Son for all that he has done for you. So when it comes to points of discipline, realize that that also is a gift from God. That is also a blessing. One other thing to consider, though, is that sometimes things are not discipline. Sometimes things are a result of us living in a world of sin. When a loved one contracts cancer and dies, that's not the will of God. He did not call them home. Our world is plagued with all sorts of contaminants. The physical manifestation of sin upon the body is going to happen because sin is present in our world. Things are not as they should be. And God didn't design it with flaws. It was sin that caused that. So we need to be careful when it comes to things of health and also accidents. Sometimes God intervenes. Sometimes he speaks to his children. Sometimes he speaks, but we do not listen. And that comes to situations of life and death. And it also comes to the small points, the minutia in which he's trying to lead us on the straight and narrow way more closely, but our ears are deafened by the roaring thunders of this world. So what's important to know is that he is with us. God is with us. And he is always working with us, carrying us through hard times, holding our hand as we walk on the path. He's not our adversary. He's not against us. He's always wanting his good will to be manifested in our lives. 
On Monday's lesson, Ahaz was startled when Isaiah greeted him and introduced his son, named A Remnant Shall Return. And the message that God had for Ahaz was simply this it means what you make it mean. Turn from your sins or go into captivity, and from captivity, a remnant will return. The decision is yours. So here we see Ahaz at that crossroads where God is there to provide relief and protection for the nation of Judah. But if Ahaz chooses otherwise, if he aligns himself with Piglath Pileser III, the king of Assyria, he's aligning with an enemy of God. It provides him the temporal protection that he needs from Syria and Israel, but he's making an alliance with the pagan kingdom that will eventually lead to his destruction and the destruction of his nation. So God was there for him and asked him to follow him. But would he listen? I like at the bottom of the lesson where it says, the threat from Syria and Israel would pass and Judah would be spared. Powers that looked to Ahaz like huge fiery volcanoes were in God's sight only two smoldering stumps of firebrands, Isaiah 7.4. There was no need for Ahaz to appeal to Assyria for help. But in order to make the right decision, Ahaz needed to trust the Lord and his promises. He needed to believe in order to be established, Isaiah 7, 9. So here we see an example of what I was talking about previously, that God is present, God is active, God is wanting what is good for his people, but the choice remains to which road to take. We're at a crossroads, and we have a branching crossroads in our lives with every decision, great and small, all the time. Now, some of them are very small. Should I write with the blue pen or the black pen? The significance of that on your eternal future is likely insignificant, whether I should marry this person or whether I should marry that person. The effect on your life will be permanent. It is a heavy choice. It will greatly influence how you grow, how you live, your faith, where you move to. It'll affect your children. It'll affect everything about your life. So when it comes to decisions, great or small, we need to lay them before the cross of Christ and ask God to speak to us and to lead us on the way. Because as I said before, he loves us very much and he wants what is good for us. I would only add one thing that we need to believe and we need to have that faith. And to obtain that faith, to obtain that belief, we need to, by our free will, ask for it and read the Bible a little bit and desire it, knowing that the future is uncertain, that there are problems that will be coming up. There are important decisions to be made. We need courage to stand for what, what is right. And we should beg God in prayer for the faith and the courage and the belief that we need and knowing that that is exactly what God wants to provide for us, we can have courage that God has blessed us with those attributes that we need and not to just leave it there, but to do it daily for the trials that each day provide. A daily submission is so essential for the growth of faith. And desire itself is something that is instrumental in the transformation of character. It's far easier to read and to know the truth and to let it sit stagnant within your mind and soul. But when you have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, when you desire to eat the word daily and for it to be a part of your character, then you see God really moving on who you are right now and who you will become in the future. Yes, we need to acknowledge our sinful state. We have to seek God in a humble fashion. He's there to prove himself. Just as we read in Tuesday's lesson, when Ahaz did not respond to Isaiah's call for faith, God mercifully gave the king another chance, telling him to ask for a sign that was deep as Shaul or high as heaven. Let's read Isaiah 7, 10 to 13, about what you just said. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord, your God. Make it deep as Shoal, 
or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of man that you will try the patience of my God as well? So deep as the grave or as high as heaven. And really that illustration of asking for a sign that's as deep as the grave or as high as heaven is such a powerful way. When Ahaz and that nation is dealing with a situation that would cause their destruction, their Mm -hmm. demise, their death, or they can cling to God, ask for the salvation from this impending doom and be lifted up as high as heaven that their salvation is coming from heaven itself. This has got to be one of the greatest invitations of faith ever given in human history. And yet Ahaz was not even willing to allow God to help him to believe. He didn't even ask for a sign. He was asked to ask for a sign. He wouldn't do it. I think the lesson brings out on this day uh, that Ahaz is rejecting this amazing offer for this sign, God is like reaching out still to this king one more time and saying, okay, okay, fine. Okay. Ask anything you want as a sign that Isaiah is telling you the truth and that these invading kings are not to be worried about, that you're going to be taken care of. Just ask a sign. And he refuses. Yeah. When Ahaz refused the divine offer, He rejected the Lord from being his God. The Lord was the God of Isaiah, but because of Ahaz's choice, he was not his. Asking Ahaz to ask for a sign is just bringing to mind for me when we are called to come and reason. Let us come before the Lord and understand what he's presenting, understand the truth of the scripture, understand the history of the people understand the intercession that he gave, understand that a remnant shall come, and understand that Emmanuel will be with us, that God will be with us. That brings us to Wednesday's lesson. On Wednesday's lesson, we see Isaiah 7, 14, very famous verse. Ahaz does not ask for a sign, but God said, okay, I I present my own sign to you then. And this is just an amazing situation. Isaiah 7, verse 14, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. What an amazing sign in this situation where the king refuses to ask for a sign. And then God gives the ultimate sign of his character and love and compassion that I'm going to send my son to to live the life and to to suffer at the hand of satan for you what bigger sign could there have ever been than that the ultimate sign of god's protection the ultimate sign of his love is that jesus came and would die for us i mean i've never really studied this story before like this and to see What God did in providing the sign of all signs is just, wow. I just marvel at that. Like we've been saying, the promise that God gives is that he's with us. And that son that was given was called Emmanuel, God with us. So the the special son prophesied in Isaiah 9 and 11, he exalted the description of the divine, Isaiah 9, 6 and the root of Jesse, Isaiah 11.10. So when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, to give us the presence of God with us, Galatians 4.4. 4. So all of the ways in which God revealed himself to the people and led the people of Israel and Judah through the many trials, he wanted the pure understanding of his character to be revealed in the life of Jesus Christ. And so it was. So when it comes to understanding God the Father, we should look to Jesus Christ 
the character that he showed, the man without sin, the man on a mission, God incarnate, the one who was willing to work in the carpentry shop for so long, shaping and molding, the one who spoke to the people, shaping and molding their characters by his words of insight and explanation of the scriptures through many parables that they could understand and relate to. The purity that he showed, the compassion that he gave to those suffering, those who were demon-possessed, those who were suffering from various illnesses, the sacrifice that he gave for the forgiveness of our sins, and then the glorious resurrection, where we know for a fact that Christ is not in the grave today. You can go to Jerusalem, you can search that land, and he is risen. Where does he stand now? He stands at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. So God is truly with us. He is on our side and he is trying every way possible to draw us close to him and to bring us home again. Let's move ahead to Thursday's lesson. I'm thinking again of the situation here, that God is with us. Here, Ahaz is ignoring God and seeking help from an Assyrian king. And how often are we in a situation where we're seeking help from family member? We're pouring out our anxieties on our friends. We're unloading our stresses on our neighbors, coworkers. So often, our neighbors and our family can't do anything about it. You know, we're just unloading our troubles on people and as though they can bear our burdens. And Ahaz is trying to unload a burden of this attacking army onto the, an Assyrian king. And, you know, in the story, the Assyrian king does attack, takes part of Ephraim and Samaria. It stops the siege. And we think, you know, Ahaz probably thinks, okay, see, it worked. I was right, you would say. But it had, you know, disastrous consequences to the people that were invaded and to the Israel that was the northern kingdom that was wiped out completely shortly after. The ideal thing would be to, to hold on to God and to put our stresses and our anxieties and uh, the situations that we have at the foot of the cross. So here is God saying, you don't think I'm with you. You don't think I'm around. You don't think I'm available to you. You are rejecting my assistance. So I will give you a sign that I am with you. God is with us, Emmanuel. And that's true that day. It was true the day before Isaiah talked to Ahaz. And it was true the day after Isaiah talked to Ahaz. It was true when Jesus came. And it's still true now that God is with us. Yes. When it comes to names, we can see that Isaiah has some children. Right at the beginning of Thursday's lesson, Shir Jashub, a remnant shall return, Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, which means swift is booty, speedy is prey. So often, if not always, the names given in Hebrew have a meaning. And when Emmanuel came, it had a meaning, God is with us. He was called Yeshua, which is a shortened form of Yehoshua, which in English we call Joshua. It means the Lord is salvation. And Isaiah, the name Isaiah, means salvation of the Lord. Emmanuel is not just an abstract description. It is an assertion of a promise that is fulfilled now. God is with us. And that's really beautiful. I'd like to read from uh, Psalms 23, 4 and Isaiah 43, 2. There is no stronger assurance and comfort. God does not promise that his people will not endure hardship and pain, but he promises to be with them. The psalmist says in Psalms 23, 4, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Isaiah 43, 2. When it comes to those times in our lives when bad things happen, 
Know that it is because we live in a sinful world, a broken world, nature not in tune, not in harmony with the will of the Father. And sometimes accidents happen. Sometimes disease overtakes. But it's never the will of the Father. He created everything in perfection. And it was this cancer of sin that has destroyed all that we know. We know that he wants to protect us. And in those times of dangers, he sends his angels. He sends his angels to guard us in all our ways, for them to encamp around us, for them to deliver us, for them to serve and to bring us along the way. Those are taken from Psalms 91.11, Luke 4.10, Psalms 34.7, Hebrews 1.14, and Exodus 23.20. Come close to God and he will draw close to you. Let's move ahead to Friday's lesson. At the beginning of the lesson, it says, The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. The outshining of his glory, it was to manifest this glory that he came to our world. And just like what we've been talking about, Christ was the full manifestation of the glory of the love and the truth of the Father. He came to make things clear. He came to live in perfection and to show that it was not impossible. What was the greatest accusation of the accuser in heaven is that it was impossible to live a perfect life. But Christ clung to the Father. We can see him so many times in prayer, setting himself aside and coming before the Father, talking with his Father. He walked together with the Father. He walked in perfection. And he asked that we be one with him as he is one with him, that we have that same perfection. Are we willing to submit our lives in such a manner and to walk daily with the Father? Because if we are, great things happen. If Ahaz had done so, his future and the future of Judah would have been different. He would have changed the course. And God gave him every opportunity to make that decision, going beyond generosity and patience. When Ahaz had refused and was going the wrong way, he said, just ask for a sign. What would you like to see for me to prove to you that I love and care for you and will do what is in your best interest? And Ahaz wouldn't do it. So we need to have that type of humility and understanding that a lot of the answers that we look for have been laid forth before us plainly in the scriptures. And those things that we don't know, let us put them before the cross of Christ and ask for advice along the way. Ask for us to be led in those paths of righteousness. Do you have anything to finish off Friday's lesson? The summary says on Friday's lesson, God brought faithless King Ahaz to circumstances in which he had to make a difficult decision. To believe or not to believe, this is the question. Even though the Lord offered him any sign that his imagination could devise, he refused to allow God to demonstrate a reason why he should believe. Instead, he chose as his friend the king of Assyria. Could you close with prayer, Brendan? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, like Ahaz, feel under threat sometimes. The world encroaching even our own flesh screaming out. Father, we want to be freed from the chains of sin, to worship you in fullness of heart, with souls open and broken before you, to be recreated, to be renewed, to walk in the way. Heavenly Father, you are faithful to us always, and we desire to be faithful to you as well. We thank you for your Son who was sent and gave us such a perfect example of how to live. We thank you for the sacrifice that he gave on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And now we stand with arms outstretched, asking for you to hold us dear, to take us along the way through this broken world, along the straight and narrow path. May we call all men and women and children to your side, inviting them. May we fulfill this great commission and let your gospel be known to the world. We look forward to your soon return, where we can be together with you in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
They journeyed far, a weary pair. They sought for shelter from the cold night air. Some place where she could lay her head, where she could give her babe a quiet bed. Was there no room, no corner there? In all the town, a spot someone could spare. Was there no soul come to their aid? A stable bear was where the family stayed. Do you have room for the Savior? And do you see him anew? Have you a place for the one who lived and died? A star rose, a wondrous light, a sign from God, this was the holy night. And yet so few would go to see the babe who came to rescue you and me. This child divine is now a king, the gift of life to all the world. have sought the light Do you have room? Will you come tonight and will you seek the Thank you for listening. Please click the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Bible readings taken from the NASB are copyrighted by the Lockman Foundation.